Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's uh, Environment Exchange. It's lovely to see you all. We're just waiting for some other people to join the um, Zoom meeting um, before we kick off, but we won't be more than a minute or so. Um, if you have your um, cameras on, can you please make sure that your uh, microphones are off so that we don't get any background noise coming through? And we'll, we'll start in about a minute, I reckon. Okay, um, all right, welcome. My name's Helen Oakey. I'm the Executive Director of the Conservation Council. It's been a long time since we've done an environment exchange and I'm getting big flashbacks to all of our time in lockdown and being in Zoom meetings. So um, there's a, a degree of familiarity about this and a sort of a, a sad recollection of days gone by, but it is lovely to have so many of you with us and we know that we can't do this in person yet. Um, so it's great to be doing it online. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal people. Well, many of us are. I'm sure that many of you are coming from, um, from country, uh, First Nations lands around the country. Um, but I'd like to pay my respects to the, to the Ngunnawal people who, um, whose country is here in Canberra in the ACT, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, all Aboriginal people who have a connection with the lands in the ACT and the surrounding regions. Um, and, and also welcome and acknowledge any First Nations people that might be with us tonight. Um, it's reminiscent, we're back with that background noise of the dog barking, so um, bear with him for a second and we'll keep going. <laughs> um, okay, so we have unfortunately, um, we're just waiting for one of our key speakers from the government to try and join us. Um, Zoom not being the ACT government's best friend, uh, and we're trying to figure out a different way for him to join us. Um, but I'll just go through a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off with some of our other speakers and run you through who we have in the room today. So first thing is, if you have a question um, and you'd like to ask a question, then it's best to write the word question in front of your chat. We get a lot of chat during these conversations, but if you can tag it as question in capitals, then Kirsten can pick the questions out really easily and send them through. Um, the second thing is to say, yes, please remain on mute. Um, and also if your audio quality is not so good, then it might be better to turn your video settings off. Okay, so today we're here to talk about the wellbeing economy. And some of you might be thinking, well, you, Probably you're not, that's why you're here, but some of you might be thinking about how this links into the environment. But of course it does in, in many deep ways. There's an abundant evidence that an economy focused on endless GDP growth is wreaking havoc on the environment and driving divisive social inequity. So we need to move beyond an econ, sorry, we need to move to an economic system that is distributive, distributive, regenerative and embedded within our planetary boundaries. But what does that look like and how do we get there? And can people and nature both benefit? Uh, the ACT government has produced a wellbeing framework which comprises 12 indicators in an attempt to measure Canberra's personal wellbeing and quality of life. Significantly, economy is just one of those 12 domains alongside environment and climate, social connection and health. It's the beginnings of a conversation around a different way of thinking about our economy. So tonight we were hoping to talk to, well, Peter Robinson was going to present to us first about that wellbeing framework. Um, but we're going to look at that, how that wellbeing framework is being implemented and how it relates to concepts such as circular economies and donut economics and how might it help in tackling challenges that we face such as climate change and biodiversity loss. So I'm going to, oh, sorry, I was just pressed the wrong button and nearly removed somebody from the meeting. My apologies. 
Um, I'm going to introduce um, our speakers that are with us tonight. Uh, we've got four presenters who are focusing on how well-being instead of financial wealth could lead to greater prosperity for our city, people and environment. Uh, firstly, uh, Dr. Michelle Maloney is a director of the New Economy Network Australia. Uh, Michelle's with the green screen with the sun in the background. You want to give us a little wave, Michelle? Uh, we're hoping to welcome soon Peter Robinson, who's the Executive Branch Manager of the ACT Government's Wellbeing Framework. Um, he works in uh, Treasury or Chief Minister's Department. Uh, we have Dr. Jackie Shermer, who is an Associate Professor at the University of Canberra, and she leads the Annual Regional Wellbeing Survey. Jackie, do you want to give us a wave? Yep. And Sally Holliday, who's delivering the Recovery and Wellbeing Through Nature Program at Landcare ACT. And Sally's there she is and appropriately got some lovely trees behind her. Okay, so because Peter's not um, in the meeting yet, which I'm just going to double check, Kirsten, any joy, Peter joining us? Not yet? No. Because Peter's not in the meeting, we're actually going to ask Jackie if she can kick off the discussions and then we're going to throw to Michelle, who has to head off at six. Um, so... Jackie Schumer is Associate Professor at University of Canberra and her research focuses on the intersection between human wellbeing and natural resource management. She leads the annual regional wellbeing survey which examines the wellbeing, resilience and experiences of 15,000 Australians and her work has included studies examining how engaging in natural resource management activities such as land care groups can have social benefits building resilience to drought and national dis natural disasters. Jackie I'm going to throw it to you. No further ado. Excellent. Thanks for that. So tonight's topic's about the wellbeing economy. Do we get benefits all around? And I've put a question mark on the end of that because as someone who's been working in the wellbeing space for a long time, there are some important questions we need to think about. So I think Helen's already talked about the fact that there's a really strong international agreement that we need to measure societal progress in a way that goes beyond GDP. And even the economist who designed a lot of the economic measures that formed the basis of GDP said the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income as defined by the GDP. So there's a lot of agreement that we need to start measuring progress in ways that reflect quality of life and don't have some of the negative impacts that a focus on economic growth can have if it's the pure focus. And as part of that, this idea of well-being has gone from a bit of a fluffy concept a few decades ago, which people would say, oh, well, it's nice to talk about well-being, but it's not like it's essential. We're now viewing well-being as what I would call a bottom line essential. And when I talk about well-being, I'm talking about not health. It's much, much broader than health. So well-being is a state where we're all able to realize our potential. We can cope with normal stress. We can work productively and fruitfully, whether that's paid work, unpaid work, caring for others, volunteering, and we can contribute to our communities. Now on this slide, I've got a bunch of statistics that tell you all the fun things we know about the economic benefits of investing in well-being, which seems a little ironic since we're arguing we should move away from GDP and then I'm justifying why we should using those very same types of measures. But basically there's a lot of evidence and it's growing every day that when we invest in well-being, we actually do have a wide range of benefits, including reduction in health spending, more engaged volunteers and workforce who are more productive. There's a whole range of ways we get benefits. But we have to stop and think a little bit about what we mean when we say we want to invest in a well-being economy. And I've dragged out here a few different pictures of what we often see thrown at us in the media about what well-being is. And we see a lot of pictures of people doing yoga in nature, which is all well and good, except that for me, I like to drink a whiskey in nature. That's my nature connection. We hear a lot of people talking about wellness and apparently running along a, along a beach, holding a bunch of balloons. That is how we get well-being. So is everyone convinced? That's not what we mean when we talk about investing in wellbeing frameworks. We are talking more about things like this, where we talk about addressing systemic challenges that are preventing everyone 
from having the same opportunity to live a high quality of life. It can be everything from supporting the local men's shed to standing with people for their rights that have been denied for a long time to addressing poverty in rural and remote Australia. That's what we're talking about with wellbeing. And I guess the reason I'm emphasising that is because we know from wellbeing research that our wellbeing is impacted by the big stuff disasters, personal tragedies, intergenerational trauma, experiencing long-term disadvantage. And yet when we hear people talk about wellbeing, we hear a lot of talk about there's a work initiative where you can meditate at lunchtime. And that is not a bad thing I should emphasize, but it's only one very small part of what wellbeing investment looks like. So implementing wellbeing frameworks and wellbeing centric decision-making can help us shift our entire societal focus away from the idea that we are personally responsible for our well-being and not the government to saying everyone needs to be investing in well-being in a whole range of ways. There's lots of well-being frameworks out there. I'm just going to keep clicking till these all come on the screen. Um, so worldwide, there's a lot of well-being frameworks out there. But I guess I've deliberately put a couple up there, like the Happy United Arab Emirates ones. Um, they differ in their quality. A lot of these are very good frameworks, others a little bit less. Some of them do nothing to address systemic inequities and disadvantage of some members of their population. So a wellbeing framework is only as good as its content. And we've done a lot of work, which we did when we were working with the ACT government saying, what do most wellbeing frameworks contain and what is the emerging best standards so that we make sure our wellbeing frameworks are doing what we need them to. So when we talk about wellbeing centric decision making or a wellbeing economy, it means that we start to do things like measure multiple domains of life and how well we're going. We look at how's the health of the population tracking? Are they able to afford the cost of living? A big issue in Canberra at the moment. How's the environmental health in the local area? Um, do people have the ability to participate in their local governance? Do they, does everyone have equal rights? Are human rights protected? And increasingly we're looking at things like not just are we getting the wellbeing we want, but are we making sure we are taking responsibility to care for others and to care for the environment? And the ACT wellbeing framework that hopefully Peter will be able to talk about soon um, is a great example of one of the more modern wellbeing frameworks that has actually taken on board a lot of the early lessons of wellbeing work and has developed a framework that is community driven, but also informed by international experience. So I was lucky enough to get a bit of a ringside seat to the development of the framework. I can say the ACT government did an incredible job of making sure they didn't just invite community consultation, they went out and made sure that every group had an opportunity and was enabled to have a say about what was important to them. And they've made sure that the framework they've developed recognises that environmental health and nature connection are important to health. So it's a fantastic framework. I'm not going to talk about it in much more detail, but I will just throw out a very quick plug for the work we do. My group. I do declare, I think we've just lost Jackie. Oh, no, there oh, she is. She's back. I'm back again. Yep, yep. sorry. Right. I'm in a hotel with a dodgy connection. We'll see how we go. Um, so if you ever see an invitation to do the Living Well in the ACT Region survey, that's my survey, and it's used to inform a lot of the indicators in the framework. So please take part. Now I'm going to skip a couple slides so that we've got time for Michelle to speak, but I just want to talk briefly before I finish about the challenge and opportunity of nature connection and sustainability. So Edward O. Wilson, really famous biologist, claimed that we all need to reconnect to nature if we want to achieve sustainability and that our well-being depends on it. And that idea has been called biophilia and has led to the development of biophilic design and a lot of the programs we see. However, often there's an assumption that the well-being of people if we can somehow get them to connect to nature, that will connect them to sustainable ways of living. What the evidence actually tells us is that connecting to nature supports our well-being in some but not all circumstances. It can be incredibly beneficial for well-being, and we're going to hear some great examples of that, I think, um, in a minute. 
But we need to be careful when we're talking wellbeing economies because having higher wellbeing as an individual doesn't always lead to living sustainably. And I think several generations of Western culture have really demonstrated that, where in the pursuit of short-term wellbeing, we've done a lot of damage to the environment. So we need to be careful when we design wellbeing frameworks that we don't promote wellbeing at the expense of environmental health. And we need to be careful as well to think when we're trying to promote sustainability, to recognise that when we want to achieve change, we need to think about how it will affect people's well-being because improving, in doing sustainable action in a way that improves well-being tends to lead to wider spread change and longer lasting change. Now, I think I'm going to stop there and not go on the rant about plastic plants. So I will finish on this. I was going to use it as a beautiful example of how our desire to connect to nature leads to some unsustainable outcomes. But key principles I'd like to leave us with to discuss later on, wellbeing investment shouldn't be at the expense of environmental health. Sometimes we actually should invest in sustainability action that reduces wellbeing in the short term, but we also need to, where possible, invest in improving environmental health in ways that also support wellbeing. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, that was very, very quickly spoken too. I'm going to throw quite quickly to Michelle because she does have to leave us at six o'clock. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge that we have in the room Catherine Trebek, who's also an expert in this space, and you can find her work online as well. Um, we'd give Catherine a chance to speak, but she has to leave by six o'clock too um, to go and catch a flight back home from Glasgow. But Catherine will be back in Canberra soon. Um, so Michelle Maloney, Dr. Michelle Maloney is an earth lawyer, governance expert and systems change, social change maker. Michelle is the co-founder of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance that promotes the understanding and practical implementation of earth centred governance with a focus on creating system, systems change within Western law, economics, ethics, education and culture. She's also the co-founder and director of the New Economy Network Australia that works to transform transform Australia's economic system so that achieving ecological health and social justice are the foundational principles and primary objectives of the economic system. Michelle, over to you. I know that's not everything that you do, but that's that's a good part of it, hopefully. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting uh, Nina to be part of tonight's discussion. I do apologise that I have to jump off fairly quickly. We tried to grab two of our other folks to come and speak, um, but everyone everyone was already in other talks. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge I'm, I'm normally living, working and playing on Yagara Turrbal country um, in Brisbane, uh, but today I'm here in Sydney in the Eora country. Um, and I will be very brief, but what I wanted to say was really just a couple of things. Um, I think Jackie summarised the wellbeing economy sort of shift and change over the last few years very well, that it has moved from being um, a more general sort of human health focus several decades ago to now being one of the key framings for um, an economic system that could hopefully do better than some of the GDP focused capitalist growth modes of economy. And what I wanted to mention before I do just a couple of very quick comments um, about the excellent ACT um, initiatives around well-being economy um, is sort of the story of some of the other thinking that's been going on in Australia. Um, so building off the back, I guess, of a lot of the old uh, um, initiatives from the 1970s, ecological economics, steady state economics, um, moving through a whole range of other alternatives, social solidarity and other economic movements. Um, back in 2015, 2016, a group of us, um, and when I say us, some folks in my primary organisation, which is about earth-centred governance and trying to shift from human-centred to earth-centred systems of law, um, economics, politics, a whole bunch of other things, acknowledging that we're part of the human and uh, beyond human living network. It was actually in the work that we were doing within AILA that myself and others realized we needed something like an earth economics framework, something that took um, ecological economics and the other good theories and made them much more real. That journey took us to create um, between 2016 and early 2017, the new economy network Australia, fondly known as NINA. And NINA is a civil society network. We have thousands of people connected and more than nearly 500 members of our cooperative. Um, and when we first formed up in 2016, 2017, wellbeing hadn't become a big framing. What we were doing was connecting with new, new economy coalition work in the US, 
new economy organizing network um, in uh, Europe and also Repes, the social solidarity network. And so we're um, a lovely network of people all around Australia who um, come together across different hubs. And we're very interested in the indicators um, and the emergence of the wellbeing economy movement. And I guess I wanted to mention that then in 2017, 2018, had the pleasure of meeting Catherine Trebek um, when working with Bob Costanza. Um, and they've been building this remarkable international effort, the We All um, Wellbeing Economy Alliance. I think of it as the International Alliance and they have now many country hubs. We All Australia exists and it's um, being, it's kind of nested inside the Nina family. Um, and there's a lot of terrific work going on there. And I know that Catherine's moving back to Australia soon. So I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from Catherine. Um, and so the work that Nina is doing and also um, connecting in with this wellbeing movement, um, we were really delighted early last year when we were connecting with different government agencies and different uh, NGOs who were looking at these wellbeing budgets and wellbeing indicators. And um, for those who don't know, um, people like Mike Salvaris um, and others, I think Jackie mentioned um, Jeff Woolcott and others too, um, they've been working for a very long time on the Australian National Development Index, um, Andy. I love how Australian stuff always sounds like little names. We've got Nina and Andy all getting together. Um, Andy's got 12 domains and each of those domains has its own as, um, aspects as well. And um, I really love Andy and I love what I've been looking at with the ACT wellbeing measures. Um, I love the processes they've been using. I think it's really one of the advanced approaches in Australia. Um, and with the one minute I have left to share with you, the only thing I would mention is that within the work we do inside the Australian Earth Laws Alliance and more and more in this initiative Green Prints, which is about nesting human activities effectively inside our sustainable and uh, biophysical capacity, meaning living within our limits. The one thing that a lot of these indicators don't seem to touch on or do adequately yet is actually make the living world primary. Um, I understand what Jackie was saying, and I'm going to be a bit provocative here. I certainly understand that that kind of connection of humans to nature does have good effects, doesn't have good effects. But the underlying thing that we have to keep in mind is that the economy is a social construct. It has to serve society and it all has to be done inside our ecological capacity. So I would urge folks um, who are thinking about this and exploring, and I know we're in early days challenging the might and power of GDP measures, um, but we must be building uh, human social indicators but doing it inside our ecological capacities. And that's where our Green Prince program has been specifically designed to do that. And I'd love to chat with any of you, but I have to go. I'm now getting harassed by people um, on the other call. So I really hate running, chatting and running, but um, yeah, I really want to acknowledge Catherine. And I think um, the amazing Anne Polina. Oh, she's also on this call. So insights from everyone, which I'm going to miss, but thank you so much for the invitation. And I hope to connect with you all again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Great. Okay. So we do have some, some people in the room who have got a lot of experience in this. Um, Catherine, I know that you, are you still here or have you headed off as well? You're still there. Um, yeah, I've got to go in five minutes, so I just want to like to take in. a couple of minutes just to introduce yourself and, <laughs> and um, let people know that because you are coming back to Canberra, so we might be able to get you back in person at some stage. Oh. Thanks ever so much, Helen. Hi, hi everyone. I feel like I'm gate crashing a little bit. I'm based in Scotland. I've been here for 17 years, but I was born and bred on Ngunnawal country and I'm coming home today, which is why I have to have to leave. And Peter, I'm really sorry I won't get to hear your, your slides and hear your talk, but um, really lovely to see all these faces of people joining to talk about these really important issues. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. As Michelle mentioned, it's a global collaboration of folks in all their diversity, whether they're scholars, activists, advocates, writers, businesses, entrepreneurs within government, people like Peter, who are working to transform the economic system so that it's more humane and more sustainable. And uh, just do know that you'd be so very welcome. I've put, I've put the link to we all in the chat there. Um, and as Michelle said, there's an emerging Australian hub and they need all the help they can get. So hope to see some of you around the streets of Canberra in the next few days once I land. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Thanks so Lovely much, Catherine. Travel. Safe, safe travels, and we look forward to meeting you when you get back. <laughs> okay, um, great. Well, our, one of our uh, speakers has actually managed to get into the presentation, so that's great. So I'm going to introduce Peter Robinson, who's from um, ACT Government. 
Peter Robertson is the Executive Branch Manager of the ACT Government's Wellbeing Framework Project. And the framework was developed through an extensive process of community consultation in 2019 and 2020. Some of you may have been involved in the consultation processes for the wellbeing framework. And it provides high level indicator outcomes for Canberra and helps to frame the government's focus for decision making and investment. Um, so I'm going to throw to Peter now, who's going to spend a bit of time unpacking the wellbeing framework for us. Um, Peter, you've been given a pretty good rap from a few of the people in the sector about um, how modern the ACT framework is. So <laughs> um, over to you. And um, I'm hoping that Kirsten's given you the capacity to share slides if you need to. But let us shout out if you haven't got that yet. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. And, and others who've spoken and, and everyone online. Apologies, I was late. Uh, the, the IT gremlins always happen uh, at the end of the day. It's just, it's just bound to happen. Um, so thank you. I, um, I think my brief tonight was just to talk a little bit about the ACT wellbeing framework, uh, a little bit about its, its history, genesis, uh, and um, where we've got to at this point and, and what we're sort of planning uh, for, the, for the future. So I do have, let's hope this works. Looking You're good. able to see? Yep, looking good. Terrific, thank you. So, yes, um, uh, so the, the framework, um, we commenced the project back in 2019. Um, uh, the Chief Minister having uh, indicated at the end of 2018 that he was keen to uh, build a, um, or develop a, a wellbeing framework for the ACT. That was a little while after New Zealand had announced its living standards framework. Um, and the important thing was that the chief minister was keen that we built it, not for the ACT community, um, but with the ACT community. And that, that proved to be very important. Um, so our thought was, um, and we've taken this line from, I think the Canadian folk who we've, we've spoken with, wouldn't it be great if we could? Um, so report on, what matters most to the quality of life uh, of the ACT community based on engagement, um, you know, to measure the things that matter, I think as, as Jackie has mentioned, uh, including the economy, but, but a range of other areas, including the environment and others. Um, it was important for us to think about looking not just at the, I guess, the ACT uh, average results across the, the various domains. We do well in many of them um uh you know including sort of incomes and uh, uh education and so on uh but really to look at those areas where well-being may be below average uh for for some people in the community and across our environment and institutions um and importantly the the framework wasn't just one for reporting progress but uh, to also be able to use it in a practical way in the decision making of government and also to allow the community to use it in its deliberations as well. Um, Jackie uh, mentioned the consultation that we undertook and Jackie and Rob Tanton were uh, very close allies through that whole process uh, and brought that sort of level of expertise uh, to the conversations we had at least with the sort of key peak groups and so on around some of those issues involving um, you know, frameworks in other jurisdictions. So we, we engaged with three to three and a half thousand Canberrans um, uh, overall, a range of approaches, meetings with peak organisations, individual organisations, various forums, um, uh, advisory councils, um, uh, surveys. And we also sought to talk to, I guess, the, those groups who were sort of more hard to reach. And in fact, we, we ended up talking with a number of groups who had never sort of had the opportunity to engage with, uh, with government before. And that was really important for us. Uh, and we think it was important for them as well, just to understand their, their understanding of what mattered uh, to, to Canberra and Canberra life. Um, we released in March, 2020, the day that COVID hit um, the ACT. Um, uh, we released the dashboard last year um, in April 21, 
We use a range of sources uh, of information. We, we had hoped from the day that we launched that we would um, continue the engagement with the community in, in the same way that we had in developing the framework. But uh, COVID and the lockdowns sort of uh, interrupted that significantly in, in both lockdown periods. Um, but we continued to build the, the dashboard nonetheless. But one thing we're looking to going forward is re-engaging with the community now around, particularly sort of around the issue of community data and what community ACT local community data and information is available that will help us to build uh, the richness of the framework. Um, and as we mentioned, I mentioned before, using the framework uh, in our decision-making processes. Um, out of the deliberations, we ended up with a framework uh, involving 12 domains, as you see there, um, many of them familiar in terms of other, other jurisdictions frameworks. But I think the important thing was that we build up the understanding of them in a local context rather than we could have just taken, for example, the New, you know, the New Zealand Living Standards Framework and used what they had and maybe tweaked. But we really wanted to build the conversations from scratch, which we did. Uh, we have 56 indicators and at the moment we have 100 measures uh, sitting behind those, 90 of which have data and 10 that we're still working on. And importantly, we thought it important that um, uh, we uh, develop indicators that we aspired to have information for rather than just indicators for which data existed. And so there were some where we didn't think we had the right sort of data and we're continuing to work on. Um, I mentioned looking beyond the averages and in terms of focus on community, uh, there are um, eight groups there that we identify that we're going to do particular work on. Um, and we're about to release a, um, a, a dashboard on children and young people in the next uh, several months uh, that we're hoping is the first of, first of those. And there's already been reporting on the, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island agreement um, as well was recently released. Um, in terms of the climate and environment and climate domain, uh, three indicators, so climate resilient environment and community, uh, the indicators, um, uh, the measures sitting under those, so tree canopy cover, greenhouse emissions uh, and, and heat wave resilience. I don't know that I need to go into detail on those. Um, uh, a fair bit of details available on our on our website and our dashboard. Um, connection to nature, so Jackie mentioned previously. Um, so access to waterways, uh, the use of green space, uh, both in terms of visitations, but also self-reporting. And I should have mentioned that of the of the hundred measures that we have uh, in the framework. Uh, over a third of them are subjective in nature and draw upon the great work that Jackie has done, um, including through the uh, Living Well in the ACT Region Survey. And, um, and we're working closely with Jackie on that. And that survey is providing a rich source of information for us in terms of our deliberations. I think Jackie may have mentioned uh, or could have mentioned that, you know, we certainly found that the the use of green space and, and uh, in, in both contexts there uh, has, has, has risen significantly during, uh, during the COVID, COVID lockdowns. Um, and then the question of healthy and resilient natural environment. So looking at um, our ecosystems, uh, threats to the natural environment and ecosystems, uh, the health of our catchments and water and air quality. Um, uh, Jackie made the point that that um, you know indicators and measures relevant to considering the environment and climate aren't aren't uh, confined to that domain, and so just as an example, um, in other domains we have questions around the livability of our local area, um, community resilience to um, emergencies, um, and questions around housing housing suitability. Um, and that one has been uh, yeah, important in the context of the various um, uh, um, through you know, periods of drought, bushfires, smoke, and so on. Um, 
I should mention the question was written, uh, arose there before around uh, that, you know, working towards building uh, well-being doesn't necessarily sort of uh, necessarily align with uh, the question of sort of sustainability and, and that one of, you know, building well-being for today at the detriment of tomorrow. Um, we have made a commitment in our framework that we will sort of periodically prepare a report to assess the sustainability of our indicators. Um, and we are looking to do that via uh, benchmarking against the relevant um, sustainable development goals of the UN. And we'd had discussions back at the time of developing the framework as to which way we would go. And some other jurisdictions used the concept of you know, the capitals, um, uh, you know, the various stocks and so on. But we, uh, we thought that, that uh, thinking about the UN sustainability development goals were important and contemporary. And um, Jackie was sort of part of that conversation as well in terms of looking at a sort of a contemporary measure that might allow us to, to draw the benchmark going forward. Um, and I think Jackie may have also made the point that, that uh, in terms of us thinking about the domains and the indicators we've chosen, a lot of them actually in their own right sort of have the ability to sort of highlight vulnerabilities over time, um, uh, just in terms of their measurement and progress over time. Um, so I mentioned that, that a key part of the framework was not only to um, report progress, but also to build um, the framework into the decision-making processes of, of government. And there is a, a commitment in the parliamentary and governing agreement uh, of the government uh, to explicitly there uh, examine options for ensuring a holistic approach to budgets, decision making and reporting, uh, including around our strategic and accountability indicators based on well-being. And we're in that process at the moment. So we have actually uh, legislated um, uh, to give uh, well-being a focus in our cabinet processes. And in both our cabinet processes and our budget processes, we're requiring now of all of cabinet submissions and business cases that come forward for budget, uh, the preparation of what we've called a wellbeing impact assessment, similar to that that uh, I think is used in New Zealand, uh, which requires uh, authors to consider um, uh, wellbeing evidence, uh, wellbeing impacts. Uh, impacts across the domains. Uh, so trying to pick up the important aspects around sort of whole of government outcomes and trade-offs across domains uh, in relation to uh, proposals in budget and cabinet. Um, it also focuses on the question of evaluation uh, and building, trying to build an evidence base of what works and what may not work. Um, uh, and also the question of collaboration. Uh, so have in the development of proposals, has the necessary consultation taken place, both inside and outside of government. So that process is sort of mandatory uh, now in both cabinet and our budget processes. We're going through the ACT budget for 22-23. Um, all business cases that have come forward in that context have required a wellbeing impact assessment to uh, accompany uh, the business cases. And we have done some internal assessments then around the WIAs and provided uh, advice on that to, to government. So uh, the commitment to government uh, of government to embedding wellbeing has been strong. Uh, we have incorporated, um, I guess, wellbeing language and, and analysis, the start of analysis in our budget papers um, last year, and we'll increase that this year. Uh, but there is a, a definite sort of focus on um, bringing wellbeing to uh, the table when ministers are considering um, uh, both the budget outcomes and also in our cabinet processes. Um, just quickly on what's next, the embedding will continue. Uh, these things aren't, um, I guess they're not, they're not ones where the, the winds are necessarily quick, um, bringing sort of change to how uh, within government, we think about um, our investments, programs and policies. Um, it is a cultural change and it takes, it will take some time. Uh, we've done a lot of education across the service 
um, around uh, wellbeing, the principles, um, uh, the preparation of wellbeing impact assessments and the components, but it's not an overnight thing. And, and uh, the important thing for us is that we sort of build um, you know, process after process to sort of improve what we do. Uh, we'll be looking over time to improve the measurement of what we do. Um, uh, and uh, the important thing for us is that we're on the, on the journey and, and heading, I think, in the, in the right direction. Um, I mentioned earlier on the wellbeing of specific groups. We'll continue to do work uh, around uh, the wellbeing of those groups. Um, even looking at the groups, the eight groups that we have there, it's, it's not as simple as looking at you know, group by group because their whole questions of intersectionality um, and, and you know, uh, uh, being able to understand, I guess, the richness and diversity of what makes Canberra. Um, building the shared understanding within uh, the public service. Uh, importantly for us, getting back out into the community, we've just held the, um, the, the consultations for budget uh, with a range of uh, community um, organisations um, and Helen was um, part of that process. Uh, but we within the wellbeing team have undertaken to continue that and we're happy to have discussions with groups, community groups and so on um, uh, around issues of wellbeing and what matters and including that one around sort of the data um, and, and the scope that there is to use you know, contemporary data uh, that might help to tell the Canberra story even more richly. Um, we continue to do work around capturing the evidence base for what works. We're, we're building our team from uh, 1 July, so this Friday, to be able to do more of, more of that work, uh, draw on the international evidence, work, work closely with Jackie in considering um, uh, those issues, not only in terms of just the, um, you know, the, the outcomes around measures, but also starting to get more deeply into the, the interrelationships across domains, which is important in uh, you know, the area that, that you have um, uh, you know, uh, deep interest in around the environment and climate and trade-offs and so on. Um, continuing to build our data uh, and build the, start to think about the uh, sustainability issue. And I know Helen, we had a chat about that at the budget consultations around not only looking uh, in the near term, but also sort of looking longer, longer term in terms of impacts um, uh, on climate and the environment. And that's just a little bit of a chart around the, um, the 12 domains, 56 indicators and measures that we have. Great, I've thank you. Blank, I've got a blank screen, so I'm not sure. No, um, that's right, we're back, <laughs> back to that's faces. A, that's a quick tour anyway of, of, of where we're at at the moment. Um, We've only been running for, the project's only been running for three years. Um, uh, you know, we know in other jurisdictions that, that the development of frameworks has happened um, over a longer period. Um, um, yeah, we, we, we've got aspirations going forward. I think we've done, uh, you know, we've got a fair way in the space of three years, but, but there's, always, there's always more to do, so thank you. Thanks, Peter. I've got some burning questions for you already, but I'm going to throw to our next speaker first. So, <laughs> um, so if people do have questions, just pop them in the chat bar with the word question in front of it, and we'll pick them up from there. And we'll either ask you to ask the question yourself, or I might put the question to somebody if we're just running a bit short on time. Um, so it's um, thank you so much for that, Peter. It's interesting to see how well advanced it has happened over the last couple of years while we've all been in hibernation and I'm sure that well-being has been a top hot topic for conversation over the last couple of years just because of what's been going on in the world um, so I'm just going to throw to our last our last formal speaker today and we have um, somebody else in the room that I'll introduce after this um, who is Sally Holiday. Sally um, joined Landcare ACT to deliver the new recovery and wellbeing through nature program. Uh, Sally has a strong experience in the disability support sector and has enjoyed working with clients to achieve their NDIS goals across a variety of settings. 
She's studying transpersonal counselling and art therapy through the College of Complementary Medicine. And previously, Sally's delivered engaging public programs in some of Australia's most reputable galleries, museums and festivals. Um, so I'm going to throw to Sally for her presentation. And um, yeah, keep popping the questions in there and we will come to those after um, we've heard from Sally. Thanks, Helen. Just checking everyone can hear me and see my presentation okay. Thanks, Mark, big thumbs up. <laughs> Always unsure with this uh, modern tech. So hi, everyone. I'm Sally. I'm the Program Coordinator for Landcare ACT, and I'm delighted to be amongst this panel to discuss, uh, I think, a very juicy issue. Um, I'm going to be speaking from a more um, personalised perspective of delivering a specific program rather than these, these big, broader kind of frameworks, but I will try and dovetail in based on my experience of facilitating the program and also the evaluation we've conducted so far and what participants are telling us. So I'd like to begin with a quote from one of my mentors, Wally Bell, um, just about getting out on country and that it's a process that's both physically and mentally nourishing and vital for well-being. And I continue to try and weave in as much of Wally's connection to country in my own personal process of delivering this program as I can, because this is not something new that I'm doing. This is something that's been practised for thousands and thousands of years. And that reciprocal connection to country very much speaks to what Jackie was discussing about that intrinsically connected link between the human and the non-human and that we are not separate from nature. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Landcare ACT, though I think I might be um, preaching to the choir a little bit here. So um, we are the peak representative body for, for all of the community land care that's conducted in the ACT region. Uh, we have thousands of volunteers and there's about 70 land care groups affiliated at the moment. Our role is to really support them and celebrate and advocate for what they do. Um, we have our five uh, member groups, including the three catchment groups of Ginandera, Malonglo and Southern. And then we also have uh, the R Rural Landholders Association um, and Buru Nunawo as well um, as a group that informs what we do. We have our members council um, with different representatives from each of those groups. And then we, we have our board and our staff as well. Uh, the little image that's over on the, the right hand side is actually from the um, State of the Environment report, um, which was produced in 2019 by the Office of Commissioner and Sustainability. Um, and so it's just a lovely little graphic that I often refer to in my program because it really depicts how land care works um, with its different kind of branching arms and how we link in with ACT government uh, organisations and services as well. So um, this is a, a little screen grab from a report that was put together um, with KPMG about uh, the wellbeing benefits of participating in land care activities. And what was really identified from that report was that wellbeing measures, as opposed to just the environmental concerns, um, were the things that were coming to the fore as motivations as to why land carers do land caring. So mental health benefits, um, physical well-being, obviously getting your hands in the dirt, pulling weeds and so on, but also that sense of social camaraderie and uh, belonging that comes from being part of a movement that is affecting perhaps some of the biggest concerns of our time, climate change, resource scarcity and so on. So that sense of really being able to do something about it and have that purpose and meaning seem to resonate uh, with our land care community. And similar results have been replicated in nationwide studies as well. So from this information, the Wellbeing Through Nature program was um, developed and it's being sponsored um, by the ACT Department of Health under the Canberra Healthy Grants Program for a period of two years. And so the idea behind this program is to almost reverse engineer those wellbeing benefits that are being reported by land carers and try and produce a program that allows people who may not be already affiliated with the land care community or doing environmental volunteering and give them a sort of toe in the water opportunity to reconnect with nature and build their environmental literacy. And from that, perhaps they move into becoming a, a land care volunteer. Perhaps they don't. Um, that's not our, our end goal. Um, but definitely from the small cohort um, of regular participants to my program, that seems to be where they're, where they're moving. There's also many who have not ever done any 
gardening or land caring whatsoever who have come to this program. So we're hoping that we're allowing people from, from that sort of outer periphery to really come in um, and have a go at what this looks like. What does it mean to care for nature and, and how can they be involved? So there's three main branches to the program. Uh, these are guided walks in nature, which are sensory based in, in nature. And they're, they're not really about getting from A to B or counting your steps or measuring how much time you spent um, or how many hill climbs you did. It's very much about slowing down in nature using all of your senses to really feel in and do full body listening to your environment, getting a sense of all those tiny little details that contribute to the landscape um, and becoming more mindful of your own impact in the environment. Then the conservation activities offer sort of a next level up as far as physicality goes. They're very hands-on, things like plantings, cleanup activities, um, weeding and so on. So that's really an opportunity to work with existing land care groups on projects that they are passionate about and bring some helping hands along and perhaps recruit a new volunteer or two as well. And then we have therapeutic horticulture. So therapeutic horticulture uh, is a very broad um, sort of field, but it's not to be confused with its flip side, which is um, horticultural therapy. So on this program, I'm not offering uh, therapy per se, but there are therapeutic benefits to doing horticulture. And that is more to do with personal relationship to plant. Uh, so rather than a big conservation activity where you're putting existing plants that have perhaps been propagated by Greening Australia uh, into the soil, you're actually growing plants from scratch. So you're seeing the whole process through and you're contributing from the beginning. And so creating a habitat for wildlife has a sort of legacy impact as well. So this is something that we're looking at doing with perhaps people who can't come and do more of those physical labour activities um, including, say, older persons, for example, who's one of my target audiences for the program. So older persons, younger persons, um, as well as Aboriginal people and culturally and linguistically diverse communities are my four key target cohorts for the program. That being said, the program is open to anyone, um, irrespective of which you know, background they come from. If they feel they would benefit from a mental health or social connectedness perspective, they are welcome. Uh, and we run specialised activities for those uh, cohorts that I mentioned to try and target them on a more personal level. So I'm just going to share with you a few images from the program thus far. Uh, this is our very first maiden voyage for the program out at Jerobombra Wetlands. And you can see at the front of the pack there in the dark green jumpers, uh, they're two of the guides for the program. Uh, Grant Battersby, he's the convener for Friends of Jera and then Andy as well from the Rangers. Um, they were great at taking people around who had never had an experience of being to the wetlands before and offering different perspectives. Grant in particular blew everybody away when he talked about a local part of the area that was a pre-Ice Age sand dune that has been documented and dated. And just that little snippet of information blew everyone's minds and created this sense of awe and wonder beyond the present moment, which was really amazing to witness. In addition, um, one of the participants said that the frog song gave her hope. I don't know how you measure that, <laughs> but it was quite profound as well. Uh, this is um, a few snippets from said program. So the one in the middle, obviously, everybody's gathered around in the reeds listening to the frog song. Uh, on the left and right are pictures from Bluett's Block, which I recently took two community groups through. Uh, and that's an example of a partnership we've done with communities at work. So our primary partner for the program is Wellways, and we're working very closely with them um, to understand wellbeing from that community-centred uh, level. But in addition, we are working with other community-based groups and Communities at Work was just one of those, particularly looking at engaging the culturally and linguistically diverse community of Denman Prospect, quite a new area under development in Canberra. So seeing Bluett's block alongside that new development was quite special for the participants of that program. This is an example of what Nature Connection looks like on one of the walks that we've done. So this is creating a kind of nature mandala. 
Um, it might seem a bit hippy dippy, but even just arranging uh, found objects that were gathered on the walk as we moved around the gardens at Featherston uh, and putting them out on the log in amongst the bamboo forest and just paying attention to their shapes and textures, paying attention to the contrast between a fluffy bit of dried grass and a definitely firm, strong, spiky seed pod. Um, just these little details of noticing and improving our sensory awareness and perception. Everybody said that this made them feel more relaxed and more calm. We've also done a special series of walks designed to um, look at the tree as a metaphor for uh, ourselves, our identity. Uh, and I call this activity the tree that is me. And it's really based on narrative therapy and the idea that if you can work through the roots all the way through to the canopy and compare that metaphor to yourself and your own life, uh, it can be a way of examining yourself and bringing all those different parts of yourself into an integrated kind of image that you can carry with you. So this was a six-week series where we moved around different sites in Canberra looking at different trees and then we created our own tree at the end. Uh, moving on to conservation activities. So this is an example of a hands-on opportunity uh, to contribute to a, a planting for rewilding day at Emu Creek uh, in Belconnen. And to the left, uh, you see John, passionate in his yellow gloves, talking about the site. He's a local resident um, who has really given the last three years to transforming this site and rewilding it back into a natural grassland type uh, you know, space. So for the volunteers who came and worked on this site, they were all new, they'd never done work at Emu Creek before. Many of them had no idea how to tell one plant uh, from another or one weed from another. And yet they really threw themselves into the process and got a lot out of this experience. And I know many of them have since gone back to check on the plants that they put in, which is lovely. Uh, conservation activities can also look like this. Uh, so this is an example of a cleanup out on watercraft at Yarraby Pond and Lake Ginandera. Uh, again, uh, retrieving rubbish can't always feel like a very pleasant experience. We can go through the gamut of emotions of, oh, gosh, why is this stuff even here in the first place? Um, but doing something about it is a regenerative practice. It's beyond sustainable. It's actually returning the environment um, to the state in which humans should have lived it in in the first place. So... Um, a lot of the participants felt particularly empowered by this activity. We also had a little look at water quality that day and, and did some um, measuring of the different uh, macroinvertebrates that are in the water. And you'd be surprised, most of these participants were in their 30s to 70s, but they were all down on their hands and knees like small giggling children. They were delighted to see all these different creatures um, and contribute to the actual testing of the water. So just goes to show that, you know, young at, oh, young at heart, um, it was a great activity for the day. And we did find that some of the more fragile species were present in the water, which affirmed our efforts of, of cleaning up the water and keeping it fresh. So this is a, a quote from one of the participants in the program. Um, and I think it really exemplifies uh, what I'm receiving from, from participants about how they feel about being part of wellbeing through nature and that it's, it's tapping into wellbeing for them on several different levels as well. And then this is a little bit more feedback that we've got so far. So we are conducting an evaluation survey um, through the University of Canberra, and they will be doing phone interviews as well to get qualitative data about the program, which will be very interesting to receive. But on the whole, what we're noticing is that people are self-reporting measures of around five on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of their mental health and social connectedness before participating in the program over the last 12 months. So I think COVID has a lot to do with that. Um, and it's quite interesting to see that a lot of these people are reporting lower measures of well-being. And then after the program, you know, they really are feeling a sense of nourishment. I'm doing a little post-it note activity pre and after the program, which might seem like a very informal data measure, but it's playful and fun and people participate, which is really great. And what I'm noticing is that people are generally moving from a more agitated, uh, sort of restless state of being stressed, um, preoccupied, and then moving into a very calm, centered, grounded and connected state 
after. So just two hours in nature doing these kinds of activities seems to have quite a profound effect. So this is me and this is the program. So if you wish to be in contact, um, this is one of the best ways to go about it. I just wanted to share a little personal story um, from me getting involved in this program. I have been charged with contacting a lot of different land carers to run walks or conservation activities, many of them I have not met before in my life. And I was on the phone one day having a chat about somebody who seemed like a good prospect for doing a guided walk in the Mulligan's Flat area. And we were just having a chat, getting to know each other. He said, so tell me about your land care background. And I said, well, I don't really have one. I haven't done a lot of work in this space before. I've come from more of a, you know, therapeutic background. But I did plant some trees um, when I was a small child over at my primary school as part of a wildlife rehabilitation kind of program. And he said, oh, which school was that? And I said, Aranda Primary School. And he said, that was my project. I organised that project. So for me, I, I almost felt this welling up at that moment of this full circle connectedness of, wait a second, <laughs> this person influenced my life when I was a child. Now I'm asking them to do a walk on a new program in a new job that I have. So that was really interesting to me. And I thought, how do you measure that? How do you measure that sort of well-being? I'm not sure. So I'll leave you with that as my little personal story. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sally. I can tell that you love your job and that it gives you a great sense of well-being as well. So thank you so much for that contribution. Okay, um, well, the questions are firing in the chat bar and I have a list of them off to the side here. So I'm going to start throwing them at people. Um, we never like to, we never like to um, just go straight for the easy questions. So we're actually going to throw straight to a pretty tough question for you, Peter. I'll get you to kick it off. Um, and then Jackie might like to chime in behind you. Um, and the question is from Jonathan. Actually, Jonathan, would you like to ask the question? Because I know that you're here. Pretty sure you're still here. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Yeah, look, um, my question really goes to the fact that uh, we're 50 years beyond the publication of Limits to Growth, uh, which is still probably one of the most important books uh, and frameworks to inform the way we look at environmental issues. The fact is we're beyond uh, Limits to Growth, where we have a very high ecological footprint in the ACT, uh, and we face a range of um, envir uh, environmental crises this century, as pointed out by Will Steffen's work on planetary boundaries. So um, this work on uh, wellbeing indicators is very welcome uh, in terms of moving us a little bit away from looking at GDP as the primary indicator of society welfare. But, um, unless we start tackling the fact that we, we can't continue economic growth, that, that is actually one of the inevitable um, uh, drivers of environmental destruction on, on which our personal well-being relies, um, then we won't solve our ecological crises this century. So I, I guess I'm wondering, and, and therefore we won't, <laughs> we won't actually improve our well-being indicators. Um, so I guess my question, Peter, is, is whether uh, there's been any moves since I used to work in Chief Minister's Directorate to actually change the thinking on these issues within the ACT government. Um, so I think, Jonathan, just the, I guess the fact that the, you know, the, the framework has been introduced is a deliberate attempt to ensure that you know, relevant sort of conversations are had. Um, you know, we're, as I mentioned, we're sort of only, we've only just launched, you know, we've launched the framework two years ago. We're starting to build our data sets. We want to build the evidence base. Uh, and I think it's sort of the evidence base that will, uh, you know, will be, be most powerful. Um, uh, but we're on, we're on, we're on the journey. So, um, you know, to, to the extent that we can uh, build build that evidence around impacts on the climate. This was the issue that Helen, I think you you raised with us when you you met us of sort of you know when we look at you know 20 you know 2040 2050 what will what will the place look like? Um, uh, that's that those sorts of issues are, are, are ones that we're sort of keen to in, to engage in. Um, you know, we've we've so far the framework we've 
we've we've built this with a, a, a pretty small team. Um, uh, you know, we've tried to get the building blocks in place. We're now starting to think more on building the evidence base uh, and the data sets and so on. Um, and then starting to tell, I guess, what you might call the insights or the stories that help sort of frame, uh, you know, the, the thinking going going forward. Um, so a lot of work happens outside of our team. It happens within, uh, you know, our, the Office for Climate Action, the, uh, you, know, the um, you know, the Environment Directorate and so on. Um, uh, and I know they're giving sort of, you know, uh, considerable thought to these sorts of issues. But we're looking, you know, we, we're keen as a, uh, a central group, I guess, within uh, you know, within government to start to build that evidence base around impacts and 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 understandings of you know impacts and effects and so on, uh, and and build that narrative going forward. Thanks, thanks, but if I just respond quickly, I think that's great. I guess uh, as an ecologist who understands the threats facing us, I think really what the ACT government and governments all around the world need to do is. Is, is to look at out to 2040 and 2050, look at the, the global environmental threats that endanger our welfare and in some way look at how we can future-proof the ACT. Yeah. The we're, discussion, we're starting, sorry, now you finish, please. Sorry. Yeah, and, and because the discussion is still within a, a neoclassical economic framework which thinks that we can continue growth indefinitely and it's certainly not the case. Yeah. We're, we're also starting to reach out, not only, uh, I think Mike Salvaris's name was mentioned earlier on, you know, within Australia, but we're, we're starting to reach out more and more and including thanks to Jackie, um, uh, you know, to, to overseas jurisdictions as well. And, and part of our, I guess, you know, thinking about sort of impacts and what works and so on is to sort of draw on, draw on the examples and, and uh, 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 understandings of other jurisdictions internationally as well, and that, that will help us. As, That'd as be same. great. Look, the one suggestion I would be, if Will Stephan could provide a uh, um, presentation to Cabinet, I think that'd be wonderful in terms of planetary boundaries and what that means to the ACT government's future. Thank you, Peter. Good luck with your work. Thanks very much. Je Pe um, Jonathan, I'm going to build on your question and throw to Jackie. Um, Jackie, one of the challenges in this space is that there's a few people like Peter that are having conversations with, you know, a few people like me. I, I might have been the only person that turned up to budget consultation and, and talked about what's going to happen in 30 or 40 years. I don't know, Peter, um, and limits to growth. But but how do we how do we manage that conversation with the with the what is the dominant paradigm in our political landscape um, about economic growth, employment, growth of the retail sector? Um, and even around population growth. And it was very apparent to me during the pandemic that as soon as retail sales dropped, it was like, go by. As soon as immigration dropped, it was let people in. We, we haven't got enough skills. We haven't got, you know, how do we, how do we have that conversation? Or how do we start that conversation? Because it seems to be a very challenging space, even in a progressive jurisdiction like this one. Yeah, look, I'd agree with you that it's a really challenging conversation. And I guess that's partly why in my presentation, I was talking about the challenge that wellbeing frameworks can sometimes, even with the best of intentions, act to reinforce some of those underlying ideas about growth. So I think it's, it's critical that we keep on working to challenge that narrative. But I guess the challenge tends to be that often if you do it too head on, people tend to shut down. So I do a lot of work with people who are in the, <laughs> who look at the social psychology of adoption of sustainable behaviors. Now we know that if you go in really hard and fast and you tell people you've got to make this massive change, they shut down. It actually triggers people's fight or flight responses. And so you're not going to get anywhere. So it's it's easy, you know, to get engaged in the Twitter fights and everything like that, but you're not actually going to make meaningful change. What does work is the incremental conversations that gradually get people to question and to see that there is a different way of thinking about it and a different way of living and being somewhat gentle and patient with it. Um, so I guess I know that sounds a bit counterintuitive when I know we need change, we need change rapidly. I guess from my perspective, the issue is we can't necessarily get that change by 
going in um, and just saying, here's the wholesale change we need, because that unfortunately in the real world, it just doesn't work. Uh, there's a bunch of us who are probably pretty committed to making that change. We're there, we're ready, our heads are at that space, but there's a lot of people who aren't. So we've got to really focus on how do you, how do you actually gently insert and get that thinking being reinforced through all sectors? You know, I want to see your lecturer at the university, the person at the local shop, the nightly news, just all having small messages that help people change that mindset. And changing the mindset around economic growth is one of the biggest challenges we face. Uh, because, yeah, you're exactly right. We saw the pandemic and we saw people immediately panic. Oh my gosh. We might not have economic growth. That is a disaster. And yet, why? It is a social construct. So, yeah, I'll stop my rant now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, do any of the other speakers want to respond to that question at all before we, we go to the next another question? Um, only to say, Helen, that I, um, uh, I guess that's the approach we've tried to adopt. We, we, we could have gone straight to a focus on... Uh, you know, putting metrics over everything and uh, determining, trying to determine metrics of well-being, and you know, uh, every cabinet submission or business case that comes forward to have a uh, a metric over it to have an ordinal thing saying this one's better than that one. But but the feeling was that that would take you straight to the numbers, whereas what we've tried, what we're trying to do is actually build the conversations around the understanding of what we've done as we as we had the engagements with the community. So we also had engagements within the uh, the public service right around. We've done road shows, we've had seminars, all those sorts of things. And um, uh, as Jackie said, it takes time and it's it's not only a once -a either. Um, I worked, uh, I, I've been involved in, I guess, wellbeing frameworks back in Commonwealth Treasury uh, and less, you know, we, we learned there that it's not, the conversation just today, you have to reinforce the conversations to, to change culture uh, and change the way of thinking. So that's that's what we're trying to do. You know, we will look towards sort of, uh, you know, um, better ways of measurement and so on going forward, but uh, it's been trying to build an ownership from within uh, of, of the, the idea and the concepts and the framework to the point where, you know, we hope that people will, it'll just become a natural part of conversation. Uh, and if you're developing a policy or a, a program or uh, an intervention that you're talking automatically in sort of well-being terms and thinking about the impacts across uh, the, the in, this, in our case, you know, the, the domains and the indicators and so on, and to bring that sort of whole government collaboration. So that, that's where we are. So I would sort of endorse, I know it's sort of, it'd be great to have uh, click the fingers and change sort of absolutely happens tomorrow. But, but um, you know, I think it is a case of, um, uh, you know, bringing people along, building understandings, building buy-in. Peter, um, I was quite challenged when I first saw the indicators to see that um, economics, like money, is actually an indicator of well-being. When in, one could say that money is, an end, is a, a means to an end that delivers some well-being, um, is that something that that needed needs that sits at the core? And Jackie, you might know this sits at the core of all wellbeing frameworks. That having a healthy economy is a wellbeing indicator, or is it the sort of the features of that, you know, unemployment, um, meaningful employment, potentially even? Um, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Maybe Jackie, to you quickly, if you you're across all those different frameworks. Yes. Unless Peter wants to jump in, I'm happy to. <laughs> um, look, this is actually a real area of debate in wellbeing frameworks, and there's been actually quite a lot of contention about this. So the only time I've ever seen, um, I've gotten to attend OECD meetings on wellbeing, and the only time I've seen it almost end up in a fight was when two people very passionate about their wellbeing framework were arguing, should the economy be included in your wellbeing framework or not? The reality is that yes, money is a means to an end, but it's a bloody important one. So um, we can either measure all the things that money gets us, or we can say, okay, we do know from thousands of studies that up to a certain point, 
not having enough money is catastrophically bad for your well-being because that is what our lives are structured around we don't have many options for not living in that economy and while we have an economy structured around that yes it's an important well-being indicator um, we also do know and it is important to make sure when we do include economic indicators you know say we're doing an indicator on income above a certain level earning extra income doesn't really add much to your well-being there's also really solid evidence of that so up to the point where you can cover your basic living costs and you can know that you've got some security in your future it's really important beyond that yeah pretty minor you don't need to earn you know earning an extra hundred thousand dollars after your first 200 is not frankly going to do much for you um so you might want to spend that money better elsewhere like donating to good conservation projects or things like that um, but yeah, so while we have a world and a, you know, that is structured around this concept, yes, I think it's an important well-being indicator. I would love it if in 20, 30, 40 years time, we're at the point where we're thinking differently about what's important to life and we're structuring the way we live differently enough that it becomes a less important indicator. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Peter, I've got a question here from Helen. Helen, did you want to ask that question yourself? I think you're right there in the middle of my screen. I'll need, need to unmute you. You want me to do it? Uh, <laughs> you are. can ask. Yeah, you can ask the question. I'll stay unmuted in case something comes up. Um, so the question is that GDP has a limited number of indicators that make it relatively easy to report and interpret. So, and we do see GDP being reported on the news and in financial reports. Um, are there indicators that we can talk about that could be adopted that enable the acceptance and elevation of, you know, the viability, the validity, the validity of well-being? Is there is there a simple way that we can talk about that in terms of indicators to communicate that? Sorry, that's to me, Helen. Yes, yes, to you, Peter. In, sorry, in in lieu of GDP or yeah, no. I guess no. Oh, sorry, Helen, no. you should have asked no. the question. <laughs> okay, I should have. I can't see it on my screen because I'm on my iPhone. Um, uh, GDP has a number of indicators. Uh, I was thinking of parallel uh, reporting, Peter, um, where you could work on half a dozen or some very key uh, wellbeing indicators uh, that might be able to be reported along with GDP particularly um, while the concept of well-being is um, growing um, in, in its validity. And sorry, um, do you mean uh, indicators around the economy, but other than GDP? No, uh, probably other than GDP. You know, uh, you've got 59 um, indicators. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any that can be, what, what's the word, sort of uh, built on? I've forgotten what the word is. So, I mean, uh, under, under our, I'm just thinking, under our economy domain, we have, there, there is sort of economic performance and GSP and so on. Um, but, you know, we have sort of, you know, indicators around employment, uh, uh, importantly around income inequality. No, um, no, you're still thinking economy. I'm saying parallel to, to GDP. So there are there are 59 indicators that, that measure a whole lot of other aspects of well-being apart from your um, uh, your financial situation. Yeah. I don't know if you've got in there. I know there's a very strong correlation between income uh, and and economy and your your sense of control over your own life uh, you know if from a well-being perspective you are reporting I wouldn't be looking at how much income I've got but my sense of control or my sense yeah yeah over my life it gives me access to a whole lot of different things that I can't get if I'm poor so so well-being um, indicators, Peter, I think. Hmm. Sort of more tangible, yeah. tangible well-being indicators. Yeah. I can yeah. give an example I, I, of I, one I'd do. So 
Um, just just as an example, in our most recent survey, we found that despite the ACT having quite strong economic growth through the second half of last year, the proportion of Canberrans who said that they would recommend Canberra to others as a good place to live fell by almost 10%. That livability indicator is a good example because it means we've had a growing economy that people aren't finding the ACT quite as livable as they did previously. And that tells us, okay, something's happening here about their well-being that we need to look into. Is that the sort of thing you're thinking of? Yeah, it is. Livability is a good one, actually, Jackie. Uh, so, yeah. so we have, there are measures, um, you know, we have uh, measures around livability, uh, livability of local area, connection to camera, which is the one that Jackie has just yeah. mentioned. I, I guess, you know, um, measures like levels of social connection, levels of belonging. Yeah. Uh, levels of loneliness. We have we have those across the other domains, which I give uh, you know uh, we feel anyway gives a sense of connection to 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 Canberra. If they're the sorts of ones you are maybe thinking about. So, are you thinking about anything like that that could stand beside GDP as a regular report? Well, those those ones that we I just mentioned, they're they're in the existing framework already. And so they do get reported on, Helen, yeah, but they don't get on the nightly news. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Peter, I how... Think, I think the other interesting thing, Helen, is that that in terms of, uh, you know, GDP and income, um, Jackie, you also ask questions about how people feel, huh? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, levels of prosperity... Uh, uh, how people feel about, um, uh, you know, price changes and so on and, and cost of living. Uh, so as opposed to the specific, you know, what's the CPI, what's the GDP, uh, what are income levels by decile, all those sorts of things. You're actually asking, I guess, the, the questions that, you know, despite or in addition to those level measures, how people are actually sort of feeling. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm going to throw to Sally because she's got her hand up and I think she had something she'd like to add to the conversation. Mm, there we go. Hand down, mute off. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say in terms of like, you know, I, I'm aware that I'm kind of stepping slightly left of field here about like what the conversation is revolving around. But in terms of a very personal experience of with, with working with my participants, I have participants who are struggling with mental health, struggling with housing, struggling with family dynamics, struggling with uh, lack of job opportunity, uh, all these things that are kind of economic oriented type measures. When they step out into nature on one of these programs, the bar is reset because nature doesn't judge. Nature is open to everyone. And because these programs are being supported by ACT Health and they're being offered at no cost or very limited cost if they're a very fancy kind of program with extra resources and things, but for the most part, every single program I've run so far has been zero cost. That also is giving people an in to be able to go do something good for themselves but not have to pay a gym membership, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm noticing about the measures that are coming back to me are things like a sense of belonging, where yes. otherwise they don't feel like they belong. So that was something, Helen, I think is really one of these well-being indicators as opposed to a, you know, economic one. Um, a sense of safety that isn't to do with whether you can cross the park at night because there's lights or not, but a sense of safety in that they didn't feel comfortable to go walk in a reserve by themselves. But because I'm offering a group structure, they have that physical safety of a group, of a guide. Everybody is commenting about so good to have a guided opportunity. And I think people are very nervous with this COVID and, and sort of the long-term impacts of that. Yes, for many people, they went and put energy into reserves and went out walking and, and got out there, but they did that with their family, perhaps, because they were all together at home. Whereas now, as an individual, again, trying to fit back into society, they're actually finding it quite isolating to go out into nature on their own. They don't feel confident. To their local park, perhaps. To a reserve, no. No even to show up to a welcoming land care group of people or oh, too many new people, new faces, I don't feel safe, right? So having the scaffold of the wellbeing program has been really, really important for these individuals. And I think there is something very interesting about that. What does psychological safety 
look like in a well-being sense. Yeah, Thanks, so I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that one on the news at night, the psychological safety rating for the evening. <laughs> Uh, with the connected, I don't know if that would increase it or decrease it just by reporting on it, but the connected yeah, it is important rating. information. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Look, we've had lots of really interesting questions. I'm so sorry that we haven't had a chance to get to all of them. Um, I think my overarching question from the end of the session is, um, is 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 to Peter, but I don't want you to answer it, Peter. I just want to put it out there, which is how great it would be to see the ACT government starting to use this framework to actually make decisions of prioritise spending and prioritising programs. And I know that's what it's all about, um, but it will be really interesting to see what happens when, when that becomes part of that decision-making process in a really active way. And all, yes, all hail to your work in that direction and keep it going. Um, and th I wanted to um, just say thank you to all of our speakers, including Michelle, who unfortunately had to leave us earlier, but thank you for um, your presentation tonight. It's an, it, it, it was a slightly sideways conversation for the Conservation Council to host. And it might seem that way, but it's not really because we do know that at the core of, of what the challenges we're facing is the impact that we as human beings are having on our planet, the consumption, consumptive society that we live in, the way that we, we focus our, um, our, our growth, our economies, our, our jobs and all of those sorts of things so it is actually sits at the very core of what we're interested in um, but we don't have the solution unfortunately for tonight um, and it has this lovely intersection with nature as well which I think we've all been made aware of over the last couple of years so thank you to Michelle to Peter Jackie and Sally um, and also to you in, in the audience for your contributions tonight um, I just do want to mention that it is one day of the end of the financial year so if you do like the work that we do, talking about money, you're very welcome to give us a donation. It'll go towards a very good cause, tax deductible. Um, thank you to those of you who already have, because I know that some of you have already made wonderful contributions to the work that we do, and we really genuinely appreciate it. Um, it's what keeps us going. Um, I would like to just promote, uh, let you know that the Conservation Council is holding a, um, an event on September the 15th. Um, CBR 360, it's our Circular Economy Symposium. Uh, we're super excited about it. And in, in a week or so, we'll be announcing who the speakers are going to be for that event. Um, it's going to reach into and open up a conversation with um, government, business and the community about the opportunities in the circular economy, which is only one part of this conversation about how we operate within, within our limits and how we operate within a wellbeing framework. Um, but it is that that part about that looks at that that cycle of, of um, consumption, use, reuse, and avoidance. Uh, so the event has been recorded tonight. Just want to let you know that it will be on our website in the next couple of days, linked to the event page on the website. So if people would like to go back, we have had a request um, for the slides, so we might reach out to our speakers afterwards and see if they're open to making the slides available, um, but what, and we'll let you know, um, the people who've come tonight will let you know as soon as we can. Uh, so thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, big thank you to Kirsten Duncan, who's um, our climate and sustainability campaigner in the top corner there for organising tonight's event. Much appreciated, Kirsten does amazing work and she's pulling together the symposium as well uh, and doing a great job on that. So we hope to see you at the symposium. Um, and we might see you before then as well. Uh, thank you again and have a great evening. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.